But as we were studying in, studying in the Be a Berean course, many promises in, in different passages of Scripture are based on foundational truths, and we find those foundational truths right in the passage alongside of the promises. So this message series that we'll be looking at over these next few months, I called it a gallery of grace because we're going to be looking at these promises that I've selected and the truths that they're based on. And I got thinking this week that I didn't know back then what we'd be facing right now, but I don't think there could be any better thing that we could be listening to and, and hearing from God's Word than His promises at this time. So we're starting off with some pretty strong ones in John chapter 10. So I hope that what I'm hoping is that uh, what we look at today is going to give you some help and encouragement and strength as we, we face the coming days. So we're looking at, at John chapter 10. And I'm going to be reading verses 25 to 30 in just a minute. But uh, I want to start into this topic with uh, just a little incident that happened to us. And of course, we're talking today about, well, John 10 is that great passage on, on being the sheep of the good shepherd. And, and that's the, the topic today. But what, I'm, what this reminds me of is, is at our last church, when this was a number of years ago, we made the decision to begin to begin producing a, an outdoor live nativity drama that we would do at Christmas time over a couple of weekends. And so obviously what this involved was, was getting some live animals. And uh, here's a picture, just one shot of, the, uh, of one of the guys that was involved. Uh, this, this guy's name is Murray and he was a farmer, but he had a buddy who was also a farmer who, who uh, had, these, had these show sheep. They were like expensive, you know, well-bred sheep, and he would take them to the Royal Winter Fair and so on, and uh, these were prize-winning sheep. But anyway, Murray talked his buddy into lending us one of his sheep for our, for our live nativity uh, presentation. So the first night, <coughs> the, the people gathered there in the bleachers outside, this was behind the church, and, uh, and the whole drama began. But when it came time for the shepherds to come out and the, and the sheep to come out, uh, Murray, was uh, was the only one who was allowed to even go near the sheep. We were all kind of on pins and needles because of the value of this animal. So anyway, Murray tried to lead it out to the to where these the shepherds were, but it wouldn't have anything to do with it. And in fact, it broke away from him and bolted out into the into the forest that was behind the uh, behind the church. So I don't actually remember if Randy, the guy who owned the sheep, was there that night. I don't think that he was. I think that we couldn't get the sheep back, and we're all just. And it was a showstopper, and not the kind of showstopper that we really intended. People, people in the bleachers were laughing at this, and meanwhile, we're kind of red-faced. And uh, so, um, anyhow, we, we did get Randy there, and of course, he was able to go find the sheep, you know, called the sheep, found the, the, the sheep, and brought it back. And uh, the sheep obviously didn't participate anymore in our presentation. But, uh, and I have to say, too, that, you know, the Lord went on to bless the, that... Um, that whole thing that we did year after year, but that first time through was pretty rough. But the thing that the thing that, that illustrates is there was only one person that would come, that that sheep would come to. There was only uh, one guy that it would follow. And that's a, a really great introduction and a great illustration of what this passage is talking about. So I want to read it to you. This is John chapter 10, verses 25 to 30. I'm kind of breaking into it here a little bit. What's happening is that there's a feast going on in Jerusalem. Jesus is walking around in the temple, and some Jews gather around him. And when it, it says there in the scriptures that it was Jews, it, it really means the leadership. They surrounded him, and uh, they were putting questions to him. They were saying, who are you? Tell us plainly who you are. We want to know. And in verse 25, this is, this is where we'll pick it up. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. So Jesus had done a lot of miraculous things that should have shown them that he was from God the Father. But he goes on in verse 26 to say, But you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. Now, we tend to jump into this passage in, at, at verse 27. But Jesus didn't just randomly stand up and start saying, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Those are the verses we're familiar with. But these verses that we're familiar with are really an indictment against these leaders. So we can read it in that sense. He goes on to say, My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. 
No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And then it goes on to say that the Jews picked up stones and were about to stone him because of what he was obviously claiming. So, first of all, I'll give you the, the overall thought here of, of what we're talking about in this message. And that is, the, and this is the final exhortation that comes out of this whole passage, and I want to unpack everything involved in this. But uh, the exhortation will be, follow the lead of the shepherd who provides for your need. And of course, our biggest need is the need for the dealing with our sin and eternal life. And that's really what the shepherd gives to us. But I want to unpack all of that for you and give you some things that will hopefully encourage you and help you along the way uh, this week. So Jesus speaks these great you know, promises and truths uh, in, as an indictment against these religious leaders who, who uh, were, you know, they were surrounding him and accosting him. And there's an interesting thing here that I, that I noticed as, as, we, as we read this, or as I was looking at it this week. Verse 26 seems to be backwards. Jesus says, you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. Now from our point of view, we might, we might say, well, that sounds wrong. Shouldn't he have been saying, you are not part of my flock because you don't believe? The other way around. But the answer to this is what Jesus is saying to them is that they weren't part of the true flock of Israel. They weren't part of the real spiritual chosen people of Israel. And uh, we, we find other references to that in Scripture. I think in Romans, it Paul talks about that, the true Israel. And what Jesus is referring to is that there were people in Israel who were, were, were true in their hearts to God. So in other words, they believed God's promises. They obeyed the law from their hearts. They were looking for a Messiah who would come. And when John appeared, these people went to John and they were baptized and in their hearts repented of their sin in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. So these were the true flock of Israel. But Jesus is saying to these guys, these religious leaders, he was saying, you're not part of that. Your heart is hardened, hardened against the promises and the real spirit of the law. You might have been baptized outwardly by John, but you know what? In your hearts, you were not repentant. And so because of that, because of their resistance and hardness of heart and not entering into to the, to, to the spirit of the old covenant and not really part of the flock of Israel in their hearts, when Jesus appeared, they didn't believe in him. They didn't believe in who he was, what his mission was, what he represented. So that's what, that's what Jesus is saying in verse 26. But the great thing for us is that even though Jesus spoke this as an indictment to them, it becomes for us something that's, that's very encouraging. So as Jesus goes on and says, my sheep hear my voice and they know them and they follow me, what he's saying to these religious leaders is, here are the realities that you are not entering into because of your hardness of heart. Here are the realities that really show what my mission is, that really show who I am and what underlies that. And the underlying current of what Jesus is saying here is you cannot enter into these things because of your hardness of heart. You cannot understand them. He was saying, even if I give you a straight up answer, you won't understand because of your hardness of heart. But as I said, these things, these things speak to us. There is a great promise here in these verses. And there is a great truth that underlies that promise. So Jesus says in verse 27, he says, first of all, my sheep hear my voice. Now, notice there that it doesn't say that his sheep, he, he's not saying his sheep hear his words. So often in the New Testament, Jesus will say, listen to my words, listen to my words, obey my words. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying my sheep hear my voice. What he's saying is, my sheep, the people whose hearts are open to who I am and my, my, my mission and salvation, people whose hearts are open in that way hear my voice and recognize it. Recognize it as the voice of, of mercy, the voice of truth, the voice of life. Realize that it's the only source of those things. So this is, this is really referring to a recognition of Jesus' voice and who he is. And then it says, I know them. 
Because this recognition is a recognition of faith, because Jesus' sheep, at least the sheep of the flock of Israel, um, hear his voice and recognize that, they believe. They believed in him. And of course, this also has an application to us <clears throat> as well, because a similar thing happens. When we recognize, we hear, we hear the good news and we recognize it as the voice of truth and mercy, and we believe, then Jesus says, I know them. In other words, Jesus brings us into a fellowship with him, a fellowship of faith, a relationship of shepherd and sheep <clears throat> in which he cares for us <clears throat> and, and gives us his mercy and his grace. He deals with our sin, and uh, he uh, gives us eternal life, it says. It says, they Jesus says, they follow me. So coming into that faith relationship with Jesus is just the beginning. And we as sheep follow Jesus. We obey his, 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 uh, his leading. And he says, I give them eternal life. So that's, that's kind of the preamble. It's, it's the indictment against the Jewish leaders, but it's, but it's also the preamble. These are all realities of, of how the sheep come into the fold. The realities for us, as I said. But the thing I want you to notice is that the, again, this is a little bit gra grammatical, but the thing I want you to notice here is these are all present tense realities. These are all just beginnings of an, of an ongoing reality of God of being sheep in the fold of the Good Shepherd. And so we continue to hear the voice of Jesus. We continue through, through all of the difficulties and voices that we hear, especially in the times we're living in right now, today. We hear all kinds of voices, some of them conflicting. But we recognize that Jesus' voice is the voice of mercy and care and ultimately the voice of life. So it's not just that this happens when we're saved, it's something that's ongoing, day after day. We recognize that His is the only voice. We recognize that we are in this intimate fellowship with Jesus and that He brings us closer and closer as we, as we go through difficulty. Jesus brings us into more and more intimate fellowship with Him. We follow Him more closely, day after day. And He continues to give us eternal life. I feel sorry for the people who think that eternal life starts when they die. <laughs> because eternal life starts now. As soon as, well, it starts not just now, but it starts whenever you believe. And day after day, Jesus gives you eternal life. And the realities, we experience the realities of that day after day. These are all present tense realities that Jesus is, is giving us here. So this is the indictment, and it's the preamble to the, to the real promise here. I would say the real promise comes in the last part of verse 28. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. That's an incredible, an incredible promise. It, it promises, first of all, that, that we will bypass the eternal judgment and condemnation of God's wrath against sin. That we are protected from that as, as sheep in his fold. And no one will snatch them out of my hand, he says. There's nothing, there's no power on earth that can separate genuine believers from Jesus, the good shepherd, uh, as his sheep. Nothing can come between. So these are powerful promises. And again, I'll, I'll make some specific applications for the days we're living in as we, uh, as we get closer to the end of the message. But <clears throat> these, these powerful promises are based on some fundamental truths, and we find these in verse 29. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Now notice this, that there's, there's two hands involved here. So God, in some way, and I'll explain this a little bit in a few minutes too, God in some way gives these sheep to Jesus, and now we've got both, it's not like he turns the sheep over to Jesus, we've got both God the Father, and Jesus, the Son, involved in the care of these sheep. Now the hand in Scripture, especially the right hand, which, which Scripture refers to over and over again, the right hand of God, represents His strength. And so you've got double strength here, holding on to the sheep of the fold. Both the Father and Son involved. Both Father and Son agreed in terms of the, uh, of, of the, the will and purpose of the Father. 
And so, so, so God, God wants a chosen people. And he sends Jesus with this message to, to earth as the good shepherd to gather the flock. And so they're one. That's the thing that Jesus says next. It, 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 it kind of leads to this, this very fundamental truth. In verse 30, I and the Father are one, he says. So, several things about that. First of all, he's, he's, he's saying in an, in an outright way to these Jewish leaders, this is who I am. I've come from the Father. I and the Father are one. We are both God. Separate person, personalities. But both God and nature. But we also share the same purpose. To gather the sheep of God's flock, His true chosen people. So here are the, here are the, the fundamental realities of our existence as sheep in the fold of God. That God with his almighty, infinite, powerful hand and Jesus with the same almighty, infinite, powerful of the Son holds us in his hand. And there's nothing that can touch us in the hand of God. Incredible promise and incredible truth. I think I've, I've shared this story before. Is, is, is what we recognize as, as sheep. We recognize that in Jesus we have that kind of a good shepherd. I think I told you this story once before. This is about a, a woman who was, who, who was a, uh, doing a doctoral degree, and as a result of that, she was, she was spending some time overseas, and in, in one particular section of time, over a few months, she was, she was living in Israel. And uh, this little news article says, one day, she was, while she was walking on a road near Bethlehem, she watched as three shepherds converged with with their three flocks of sheep. The three men hailed each other and then stopped to talk. While they were conversing, their sheep intermingled, melding into one huge flock. So she wondered how these three shepherds were ever going to separate and identify all of their own sheep out of this flock. Apparently these herds were, these, these flocks were fairly big. So she waited until the men were ready to say their goodbyes, and then she watched in fascination as each of the shepherds called out to his sheep, and at the sound of the shepherd's voice, like magic, the sheep all separated again into three separate flocks. And so as an illustration of how sheep recognize the voice of their shepherd. And so we recognize these things about our shepherd. His, his uh, intimate knowledge of us. His leading, his care, his mercy. The eternal life that he continually gives to us. Now, I want to connect this with a was something in the earlier part of the of the chapter, chapter ten, because this whole chapter has this uh, deals with this metaphor uh, of, of sheep and shepherds. So in John ten eleven, Jesus says an, another statement that you know from Sunday school or Juana, you've, you've likely memorized it. He says, "I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep." So here's another core truth that all of this is based on. This this states the very central heart of why Jesus came, the mission that God gave him to do. It's the very, uh, it's at the very heart of how Jesus is gathering the flock the, uh, of the, 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 the true chosen people of God. Because only by dealing with our sin could we become part of the flock, part of God's chosen people. Only by Jesus dying and giving his life in payment for our sins so that we could turn from sin and turn to him and receive eternal life. Receive all that, that these verses are promising and, and stating for us. That's the only way it could happen. So this is core. It's, it's what it's all based on. It's what it's all about. Uh, Warren Wiersbe, I, I find Warren Wiersbe can sometimes be a little bit trite, but he's the master of, of pithy statements. And uh, here's something that he said about this passage. He said, Jesus has a threefold relationship to his sheep. He has a loving relationship because he died for the sheep, as well as a living relationship because he cares for the sheep. It is also a lasting relationship for he keeps his sheep and not one is lost. So whenever you look at this passage, you can think of that living, sorry, loving, living, and lasting relationship with the sheep, with us, his sheep. There's one big question, though, that 
And you might think at first, well, what does this have to do with us? One question that arises out of this passage, and I find this in verse 29, Jesus says, my father, and then he says, who has given them to me? Now, what does that mean? And the reason I raise that is that some of you may have heard one interpretation of that, which is, is fairly, fairly common among our Reformed friends. They are our friends, even if they believe a little bit differently than we do. But the Reformed people would say, well, that means that God chose individuals for salvation back before time began. And so he gives this, these this elect, this chosen group to Jesus at this time. But I don't believe that that's what, uh, that's what Jesus means here. I believe, again, that this is connected with verse, verse 26. I believe that this, this uh, giving was God uh, giving the flock, the true spiritual flock of Israel, to Jesus. Again, not turning it over to him, but giving it to him, in, first of all, in the sense of, here's your mission. Here's your mission, go gather this flock. These are the people who believe the promises, were looking for a Messiah, obeyed the Old Testament laws from the heart, were baptized when John came and truly repented and were ready for the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus, God gives them to, to Jesus in the sense of, go and gather them so that they will believe in you as their good shepherd, their savior, their Messiah. But secondly, I think it also means that God, when Jesus appeared, God drew those people. Remember Jesus said, no man can come to the Father except through me and, and unless the Father draws them. And so I think that this is the sense in which God gave these sheep to Jesus. That, that in practical terms, God drew these people to Jesus. God made sure that they heard him, recognized his voice began to follow him in faith because he was the one that they were waiting for. So God gave the true flock of Israel to Jesus to gather. Now you might say, well, what does that have to do with us? Well, I think it does have something to do with us because Jesus said something else, and here it is. Again, I think this is, yeah, it's in chapter 10. He says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock one shepherd. So God gave him the true flock of Israel to gather, and then what Jesus did after he died, rose again, poured out his spirit, began to gather all other nations into this flock, the flock of all who believe in Jesus, who say, yes, you are the only one, you were the, you were the good shepherd, you were my savior, I turn from sin, I follow you. So it's a little bit different for us. We don't have John the Baptist. We don't have the old laws and God's older promises. Now instead we have the new covenant, the new testament. We have the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit kind of acts like John the Baptist did in, in Jesus' time. The Holy Spirit, God uses the Holy Spirit to draw people to Jesus and help them recognize his voice come into fellowship with him as shepherd, as sheep to a shepherd, the good shepherd. Follow him, receive eternal life. The Holy Spirit is, what, is the one who does that. As a person hears the, the, the good news, the Holy Spirit works in their hearts to enable them to, to, to recognize the truth, the voice of Jesus. Some theologians call, let me throw out throw a where you may not have heard before. Some theologians call that prevenient grace. It's the Holy Spirit's working in our heart before we're saved to draw us to Jesus. You don't have to remember that. We'll be on the test. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what? What does all this mean to us? First of all, what it means is we need to initially recognize the voice of Jesus as the only one who can save us come into that faith fellowship with Jesus as our good shepherd and savior. And even in this small group, there may be someone who has never done that before, never initially taken that step to say, Lord, I leave my life behind. I follow Jesus as the only one. I want the eternal life. I confess my sin. I recognize him, recognize his death and resurrection for me. 
and I name him as Lord. So that's where it starts. But then I think that as believers, as followers, and especially in the difficult times that we're living in right now, I think we need to understand again, I think we need a fresh shot of that underlying truth that there is a God and his son Jesus the Good Shepherd who holds us in his hand. And let's remember again that there's absolutely nothing that is more powerful than the hand of God. Absolutely nothing. And what are some of the things that, that seem more powerful sometimes in our lives? Well, one thing is our past. Our past can, can drag us down. It can consume our minds sometimes. I think in a couple of ways. A lot of people, including myself, have incidents in our past, things that we've done, hurtful things to other people, and we regret those things. Uh, we, I, I was part of something that happened at our last church in connection with uh, the youth pastor, the way that he was let go, and I, I had, I, you know, I, I, uh, I felt dragged into that, and I should, I should never have been part of it. It was unjust. And so we made a special trip a year ago when we were in Ontario to go, and uh, because this was weighing me down, this regret, and I just I couldn't throw it off. And so finally we went, um, and, I, and we visited him and his wife and his, and his kids. And um, you know, I took him aside, we drove over to his church, and he showed me around, and he's the pastor of a great church down, down in southern Ontario. And, uh, <clears throat> and I just said to him, you know what, I really regret my part in that and what happened. And I said, uh, it should never have happened that way. And, uh, and, and that was a huge load lifted off. You know, and, and God is greater than those kinds of regrets that can, can press us down, that we live with and, and drag us down. He's greater than the circumstances that have sometimes happened in our past, the things that wound us and, and make us feel like, like we can never be the same again and, and affect our behavior, give us fear of some situations. And again, God is bigger than that and stronger and more powerful than those forces from our past. And of course, with the thing that we're dealing with right now, today, God is more powerful, he's bigger, he's stronger than any worldwide pandemic, stronger than any stock market crash, financial reversal and loss, bigger than that, stronger than that, stronger than any circumstance or any person that can come at us. Stronger even than death. And that's the God that holds us in his hand. He's the God that will hold us in his hand, never let us perish, never let anything snatch us out of that powerful hand. And I hope that that's an encouragement to you this morning. The final thing that we see in this passage is simply the implication, because many of these passages that have, as, as our Berean students know, Many of these passages that have a promise and a truth also have an implication, something that we should do, some sort of implied exhortation or stated exhortation. And I think we find that in verse 27, that as we, as we head out from here, we need to make a new commitment, especially in light of our circumstances in these days. We need to make a new commitment to listening to the voice of Jesus, to, to striving to be in close fellowship with him, because that's what he wants. He wants an intimate walk with us. To, uh, a new commitment to following him more closely. Receiving the eternal life. The assurance of his care. And the benefits of eternal life here and now. So opening our heart to that. And saying, yes, you know, we, we have to take precautions. We have to listen to the authorities. But first and foremost, we are sheep in the fold of the shepherd. There's a, a, a verse that I'm sure you all know, and it, here it is. The last word this morning is going to go to David, but um, Psalm 23, 6. You can quote it from memory. I'm going to get you to, uh, I'm going to, get you to, to, to say it with me from memory. Um, this is the verse that uh, starts, Surely goodness and mercy. You know it, right? So let's say it together. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, that word, that <laughs> phrase, house of the Lord, I, I looked it up, and I don't know, you know, I didn't study Hebrew, but the meaning of that word can also be animal shelter. So what I've done is I've changed the verse a little bit, and I want you to say it with me this way. 
Uh, when we get to the underlying part, it's, it's different. So don't, uh, don't just sort of, you know, mindlessly carry through and, and say house. We've already done that. This time we're going to say sheepfold because the word can actually mean that. Okay, so let's say it together with a different word there instead of house. Here we go. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the sheepfold of the Lord forever. Hopefully that gives you encouragement today as you see yourself as sheep of the good shepherd in all of these promises and truths that come to, come to bear on that. May the Lord bless you today and in these coming days. Praise team, you can come back and lead us in the final song.